I'm Matt. Um, I'm an archaeologist by trade, um, but I also work in education as well, uh, largely adult education. Um, so I work in community archaeology, that's my thing, so not the development side of things. Everything I do is community archaeology, and I run my own community archaeology business, MB Archaeology. Um, we work throughout Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire, and we do um, projects, educational courses, walks, talks, all that sort of thing. Um, but also, within adult education, we put on um, so the courses and non-accredited courses for fun, um, and a lot of the stuff we've done is in the Crestwall Crags region. So I'm the archaeologist on a project called Limestone Journeys, which you may or may not have come across, but it's based at Crestwall Crags, and it was a five-year lottery-funded project to um, look at the landscape of the Crestwall region. So it takes in archaeology, heritage, art, conservation, um, education, all those sorts of things. So. Um, I'm familiar with Crestwall Crags very well, uh, but I'm familiar with the landscape that it sits in as well. Um, and I sort of, in the last quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, I've changed the first 10 minutes, 10 minutes of my talk based on some of the things you said. Um, whether that's good or bad, I'm not sure yet. But uh, the only reason is um, I am from that region originally, so I, I'm based and live out in a Southwell in Nottinghamshire now, but I'm from Bolsover originally, so I'm from a mining landscape. I'm from a mining family. Uh, my dad was a miner, my granddad was a miner. My uncle, uh, believe it or not, he retired from mining last year, age 60, so he's always been a miner. Um, and I, I've never imagined that, you know, that could carry on right up until this day, so he's literally just retired within the last year. Um, and my dad always said that he would not let me go down the, the pit, so I took to caves and <laughs> archaeology instead. I always found some way to get into the ground. That's what he's always said. Um, but I've got a couple of little things. Because of that, um, because of where Crestwell Crag sits, within that industrialised landscape, um, it's not very well known, believe it or not. Um, I don't know if you all know it. I don't know if you've all been there. Um, but it's at the moment applying for world heritage status. So that site with those caves once it gets it, which we're pretty sure it will. We'll put it on a par with Stonehenge, we'll put it on a par with the pyramids in Egypt, and yet this is this little cave site in Cresswell, in the middle of an industrial landscape, what's so important. Um, and it sort of, it, it reminded me that um, Cresswell Craig has got a brand new visitor centre, it's about four or five years old now, about four and a half million pounds worth. Um, and we had two open days to launch the new centre, one for the public, where David Attenborough came and cut the red tape with a flint tool. But the, the day before was even, even better because we had uh, the corporate launch and we had a double act come to open that day for us. We had uh, David Bellamy, who I, I, I remember him from school and I've not seen or heard anything of him for 20 years. And he turned up, he looked exactly the same as he did in all the videos from school 30 odd years before, which was quite bizarre, really. Um, but the other one was Dennis Skinner. So he's our MP, the beast of balls over. Um, and this is where I'm going to sort of connect cycling in because they said to him, you know, Dennis, you must know Crestwell Crags. He said, yeah, I, I grew up around here. He was telling us the story. So I grew up around, around here. And as a kid, I used to ride my bike around Crestwell Crags. And um, the press said, that's a good idea, Dennis. Why don't you reenact it for the cameras? He's like, oh my God, he's not been on a bike for how many years? So they got him to cycle around Crestwell Crags. And um, he said, uh, yeah, he really struggled to do it. He said, but he cycles. Dennis, Dennis, stop. The swan was in shot. He'll have to do it again. So there are swans that live at, at Cresswell. So off he goes again. Dennis, Dennis, the sun's reflecting off the camera. You'll have to do it again. He said, but in the end, he managed to do it without falling off. Um, but it was a brilliant day. But it just reminded me how it connects, you know, how these disparate elements, I suppose, do connect. And it's the landscape, for me, that connects, connects them. So, yes, I'm an archaeologist, but my main passion, or I have two main passions, is landscape archaeology. But I'm particularly interested in prehistoric uh, landscapes and how people have affected the landscape and how we um, operate within those landscapes today. Um, so that's just a couple of little things I wanted to talk about first. Um, in terms of Cresswell Craigs, then, <laughs> you can't really see it, but um, about... Three years ago now, I had a book out, I published a book on Cresswell Crags, which 
um, documented about three years worth of research. So in my free time, not that I have that much, but in my free time, I like to do research as well on various themes. Um, but I was particularly inter interested in Cresswell Crags because it was one of my local sites. And I looked at it from an archaeological perspective, but also from a historical perspective, a study of a site and how that had developed over time and how it had been used over you know, tens of thousands of years because the earliest human occupation for Cresswell Crags is 60,000 years ago. Uh, Neanderthals were the first human occupants there, so species now, now gone. Um, but over, over those 60,000 years, people have been attracted to those cave sites. So Cresswell Crags is famous for its Ice Age uh, caves and its art. Um, but when archaeologists have dug in the caves, they've found artifacts from every single period stretching back 10, 20,000 years. So the period the art dates to at Cresswell was about 13,000 years ago. From then onwards, every single period, so all the prehistoric periods, Iron Age, the Roman, the Medieval, and onwards, every single one is represented in those caves. So people have gone back to those caves time and time again, uh, including, just before we start to look at the Ice Age element, outside the cave where the, um, the art is, the Churchill Cave. So just to say, this, this art is Britain's only known Ice Age art. So it's a pretty special place, um, Cresswell. But outside the cave, they started to dig um, in... 2008, 2009, they started to dig outside the cave and they found a huge limestone block, which is not surprising because the landscape is magnesium limestone. What was surprising is, it's about this size, about that thick, when they turned it over, it had a medieval board game engraved onto it and that had been stored in that cave. So that had been in the cave six, seven hundred years. But what was a medieval board game? And it's certainly not a travel version, you know, it, it wasn't portable whatsoever. So, what was it doing in there? What were medieval people doing in those caves, playing board games? And clearly, um, the idea is, medieval people are travelling through that gorge. It's a throughway through the high ground. It's a natural gorge. They were travelling through and they were stopping off overnight. Um, and they were playing board games. Nine Men's Morris, if anyone's familiar with that, with that game. So, pretty impressive, really. Um, but I want to look at the Ice Age art then, I'm going to give up. Um, just, just before I do move on, that picture there. Um, Ice Age art is, for me, okay, very, very interpretive. Um, we don't know what it means, despite a lot of academics saying we do. So sorry if there's any Ice Age art academics in here. But this stuff was created, this art was created thousands of years ago, you know, we don't have the story of why it was created or what it meant, so we have to interpret it. And that's what archaeologists do, you know, we interpret what we find. So I would say there's no right or wrong answer, you just have to make the evidence fit. This image here then is uh, the result of an art competition for children. So a bunch of children from the Cresswell region were shown the art and said interpret it, and do what you will. And this was by a lad called Alistair um, McNeil. I remember rightly, he was about 11 years old, and this is how he interpreted it. And the reason I like this is, I like it for its artistic, um, it's a shame you can't see all of it, I like it for its artistic elements. But why I like it is, out of the Cresswell cave art, for those of you who've been in, this image is one of the hardest to see, and yet it's the one that stuck in this lad's mind. So it was quite, you know, quite important and quite interesting to me. <coughs> and I liked it enough to put it on the front cover of my book. Um, so, whether that was a, the right or wrong decision, we'll not go into that. Um, but anyway, um, half of Crestwell Crags. So if you, if you are or are not, yeah, let's do that way. Failing. There you go, you can see it from there, yeah? Yeah, we'll go for, we'll go for that. <laughs> um, so if you are, are not familiar with Cresswell Crags, then it's a huge gorge um, cut through the magnesium limestone landscape. There's a big argument, um, or, or friendly debate, shall we say. When you look at Cresswell Crags, you see the river running through the middle. That's the county boundary. 
So they couldn't place it any better. So um, Derbyshire on one side, Nottinghamshire on the other. Uh, the K bar is in the Nottinghamshire side. Uh, but technically, Cresswell Crags is in the parish of Whitwell. So it should actually be Whitwell Crags. So everyone from Whitwell keeps reminding me of this. Uh, but Cresswell Crags is, is what we know it as. Um, completely naturally formed then. So when the ice um, melted during the Ice Age, the huge ice caps, glacial waters, uh, ice flow, cutting through the pretty soft rock, magnesium limestone, uh, carved out this gorge, but also carved out a series of caves within the cliff walls. There's about 24 caves at Cresswell Crags, but only about five or six large ones that you could physically get into. So some are more like little overhangs or rock shelters. The big ones that you can all get into all have nice names. So there's a boathouse cave where the Duke of Portland used to keep his boats. Um, there's Mother Grundy's parlour where little Mother Grundy used to live in the Victorian period. There's Robin Hood Cave. I don't need to explain that one, I don't think. Um, and then there's a the church hole. No one really knows why that one was called church hole, other than its ceiling sort of seems to resemble the shape of a, of a church's roof ceiling. So we think that's where it got its name, but we don't really know. But I just thought it was quite apt that the one with the, with the, um, the cave art in is the one that has a religious element to it, because there's a big argument that the cave art in this period did have a religious or symbolic meaning to it. And there's always been this debate within Ice Age, um, well, between Ice Age, our experts is what, what is the art for? Is it art for art's sake? You know, is it there to be decorative? Is it symbolic? Does it have links to shamanism? So there are all sorts of different arguments. And it's changed over time. But some people will still not entertain some of these, these differences. So the, the shamanism um, element, which I'm more in favour of, a lot of you know, researchers and Ice Age experts won't even consider it. So we'll say that's what I want to talk about as we move on. So there's a view from above then, uh, top right, of Cresswell. Um, oh. There we go. So <laughs> there's Church Hall then. So it's down at the far end of the gorge, the opposite end to where the visitor centre is. And interestingly, that's where Cresswell Village began. So Cresswell Village is about half a mile away from Cresswell Crags now. But from an archaeological perspective, um, before the modern village was built, Cresswell as, a, as an older village um, was just at the bottom of the crags in the field. And you can still see what archaeologists call lumps and bumps in the field. They're the house foundation, the building foundations. And there's a nice painting by George Stubbs at the bottom end of the gorge, just that side of, of the church hall cave. In his painting, he's painting a little water mill. Uh, with two chaps going off shooting, hunting. Um, but in the background, you can see buildings up against the walls of the, of the gorge, of the cliffs, that's now, now gone. And I'm told there used to be a pub at that bottom end as well. But that's gone as well. It had done a roaring trade these days. We're still around, but still. So Church Hall Cave, then, uh, is accessed over the Victorian spoil heap. So Cresswell, as an archaeological site, was first explored in the 1870s. Um, by two antiquarian archaeologists. Um, and everything they found in those caves was thrown out. So you can see the steps running up the side. That's going over the spoil heap. So all the sediment that they found in that cave that had built up over time was thrown out. When you go up those steps, this is what you're faced with. So you go through the metal grills, up some more steps to a viewing platform, and then the art is up towards the top of the cave and up onto the ceiling. And it's pretty special. It's, as I said, the only known art in this country, Ice Age art in this country. Um, but it was only found 11 years ago, April 2003. And yet, this site had been explored for you know, 100, nearly 150 years before that. So why did they miss it? Well, <clears throat> at the end of the Ice Age, when this art was created, the floor levels had built up over time. So the floor level of the cave is about level with where the viewing platform is. So it's about, it's about there, look. So a good, I don't know, seven, eight feet up, something like that, maybe a bit more. So that built up over time. So people creating the art were creating it at floor level to them. Then the Victorian archaeologists went in, dug all that sediment out, looking for treasure, um, and reduced the floor level back to its natural floor level right down here. So anyone then going in to, to look for art went in the cave, didn't appreciate that for some strange reason. They looked too low down, said, no, there's no art. Um, that didn't stop uh, a group of experts then looking for art in Britain. So we know that there's fantastic cave art on the continent. So um, you saw through um, Herzog's 
clips from Herzog's film, Cave of Forgotten Dreams, there are caves like the Chauvet Cave, uh, Lascaux, Altamira, so France and Spain mostly has all this fantastic cave art. A lot of it, and a lot of the famous images are paintings, cave paintings, but there is um, probably an equal amount of, of engravings, and that's what Britain's art is. So there are no paintings, they are engravings. Um, and because magnesium limestone is such a soft rock, it's tailor-made for engraving. So our group of experts then, there were um, two English guys, both called Paul, and there was a Spanish cave art expert. And um, they met at a conference once, decided to, um, to go and survey British caves for art. Um, Sergio, the Spanish chap, flew over. They all met at, at Paul Barnes' house. He lived up near Hull. And they decided to do a sweep starting at his house, because that's where they'd met. And they decided to go southwards. The first site they come to on their grand tour, if you like, is Cresswell Crags. So April 2003, the very first morning they look for cave art, they find it. That's how easy it is. <laughs> um, so why they don't have Spotify, I don't know. But, so they, they, they come down, and interestingly, um, the director of the site at the time, they weren't going to look in Church Hole, because this one, the Church Hole, from an archaeological perspective, has hardly got any archaeology in it. It's very strange. To give you a comparison, for example, a, a certain sort of type, tool type, um, flint tools from the Robin Hood cave, there was something like 1,078 flints, something like that, just, just off the top of my head. In the comparative levels in Church Hole, there were less than 10. So clearly there's a massive difference, and why? You know, we didn't understand why. So they, they, they looked at the three main um, cave sites uh, within Crestwell Crags, where the archaeology had been found didn't see any art, and they were going to go. But the director said, no, you know, just, just have a look in church hall. Why not? What have you got to lose? Uh, nothing. They had everything to gain. So they went in, and the Spanish chap, Sergio, I always remember Paul Bond describing him saying, he got very keen eyes, had Sergio. Uh, and he went in, and he managed to see. So it's like, if, if I was to stand here, it's like looking at art up there, just at the top of where the black screen is. Sergio looked up and thought he saw something that looked suspicious. So he scrambled up onto this ledge. Um, and when he got up there, he, he realised he was looking into the face of an Ice Age engraved animal. Um, bear with me. <laughs> now, annoyingly, um, it's, it's marked out in red crayon. Because of um, the way PowerPoint's operating today, I wanted to show you this without the red crayon on first to see if you could see it. And then the red crayon was overlaid over the top of it. But I'm not going to be able to do that. But this is that um, canvas, if you like, that Sergio spotted. Climb up onto a ledge, and this is what he saw. So it's tricky to, to make out when the crayon's not there. Um, there's a lot of modern graffiti on this bit, which is what's interested me, because that panel has attracted modern graffiti makers to it. They didn't know there was an animal there, an Ice Age animal, but they were attracted to that part of the cave. So they would have had to you know, scramble into that bit and do their engravings or write their name or whatever and they were doing it over the top of what Ice Age Man had done 13,000 years ago. So you'll see, I'm always pretty embarrassed by this, that in big letters just there, if you can see it, is MB. I promise you that that's not me. I didn't do it. Um, but there's, there's some other bits and pieces on there. But you can also see another deer's head. Um, PM and 1940. And that's important, but we'll come back to that in a moment. So what you've got then is the outline, the body, um, two legs, so side on, of um, a red deer stag. And we know it's a, a stag because of the antlers. It's difficult for you to sort of make out from this image, but the antlers actually go up onto the ceiling. So you can see as the ceiling's coming back across, and this is right at the top of the cave, They've made full use of the space. Um, when you see the experts' view of this, they've got all sorts of other things behind it, and it's normally done in different colours, to the point where they've run out of colours. It's ridiculous that they've almost got about 80 different images on this one piece. Some of them are just squiggly lines, some of it are half of a, a half of a head, some of them you have to sort of close both eyes in a dark room to actually be able to make any of it out. But clearly this piece is here. The thing that always struck me is... There are two more legs, and you can just about... Can you make it out there, look? 
So just there. So there's another leg coming down, and there's another leg at the back. They've got that as it being another animal behind the deer stag, saying that there was another animal drawn first. And we just look at it and think, well, a deer has four legs. Why can't it just be the other two legs of this deer? But they say not. So again, open to interpretation. Um, why it's important then is you can see um, how bright the modern graffiti is. So you can actually see some of it in the middle is, is quite white looking. Then compare that to PM 1940, which is a bit darker. Then compare it to our faint, the Ice Age art is. So that line there and these little notches are very, very faint. So it shows the older this art's done, the fainter the engraved lines, which you'd expect, you know, with weathering, etc. So we can almost say that this bright graffiti is done after 1940. Um, in 1940, whether PM was, came in and carved the name. But also, at some point after 1940, and those metal grates were put on the caves in 1970, yep, yeah, about 1970 or in the 70s, at some point between 1940 and, and into 1970, someone had seen this art. Because they came in, they scrambled up, they saw it and mistook it for a goat, and they gave it a goatee beard. Can you say that they've engraved a beard? Just that. It's not a very great picture, but if you go and see it in the flesh, as it were, you'll see it's got a nice goatee beard. Um, so they obviously saw it and just thought it was modern graffiti. So they gave it a bit of a beard and they didn't tell anyone. Whoever that person was, they'll know if they're still alive who they were. They must be kicking themselves. <laughs> they could have been the person that first found Britain's only known Ice Age cave art. Interestingly then, what, what this might mean is, um, we don't know why someone drew this, this animal on there, but clearly they did. What they also did is put notches underneath and there's a debate as to what these could mean. Some people said, well, it could just be grass. The animal stood on grass. Someone said it could be a tally chart. Um, there must be some meaning to it. What we do notice is those notches are done in threes. So there are nine in total. There's three and three and three, which they're not picked up here. But then interestingly, the main notches are just there. If you go and visit the cave, a few inches that way, there's another three. And then if you look there, there's another three. So clearly they mean something and they're done in threes. But other than that, we can't say exactly why. That's the main piece then, so it's an engraving. Next one's on the ceiling, and again, you'd be able to see this a bit wider. Um, you'd be able to see it in situ, but from a, you know, from a panned out angle. On the roof of the cave are two banana-shaped objects. And they're quite natural, uh, just natural formations within the rock. But at some point, um, someone spotted them and turned one of the banana-shaped objects into an Ice Age animal. So they used it for the beak of a bird. So can you see its beak running up <coughs> around its head and down its neck? You can see its eye pecked out in the middle. Look, so there's its eye. So running up its neck, head, into its beak. It comes out to its full body which we'll be able to see if I could have shown you the, the image below. So it's got a body, it's got feathers depicted on it. The interesting thing is then, um, it's interpreted as an ibis, long-beaked bird, more common in um, Egyptian art. The reason that's interesting is, um, and people are quite, you know, they're quite happy that this is an ibis, but this was done just under 13,000 years ago, and at that point, ibis was not native to Britain, or anywhere near Britain. So they're, they're engraving something that doesn't exist in that region. Now, we know people are moving around a lot, so it's either something that they've seen somewhere else and chose to depict at Cresswell. It either, for me, has something more of a symbolic meaning. You know, why do you see it in Egyptian art? Is it part of some religious beliefs or culture? Is that why they're depicting it? Um, we don't know, but again, it's got to be something more significant than just engraving a bird on, on, a, on the ceiling of a cave, a bird that doesn't exist in this region. Clearly, the person saw it at some point, though, and knew how to depict it. The next bit, then, and again, you could have saw this... Um, this is the bison. You could have, you could have seen this... Again, in situ, without the outline, 
this is the one that's really difficult to spot. It's a bit further back into the cave, um, and it's done on the same side as the deer stag, but it's done in a bit where it's always wet. So the dampness um, hides it a little bit. But I've, I've picked it out for you, so you can see, again, it's the side profile of a bison. See it's back and up to its shoulders, around its head, the eyes depicted, the horns are depicted, um, the musculature, I suppose, of its shoulder haunch is depicted, down to where its front leg should be, but then they run out of room, and then along its belly and back up around its rump. Um, and it's about that size, in all fairness. Again, engraved very, very slightly. Now, that shouldn't come as a surprise. Bison, um, deer, they're the things that people are hunting. The things that people are hunting, killing, eating, and using the bones and the hides to make tools and clothing from. Ibis, not so much. So it could be that just representing the animals that are part of their everyday lives. They could be representing it from a hunting perspective. And this is one of the, the, the reasons or the suggestions of why you get animals depicted. Uh, generally in Ice Age art is it's almost representing the hunt. Now, whether that's done from a shamanistic perspective, so they're asking the gods, whatever they believe in, for power, you know, for help in, in the hunt, in the kill, we don't know. Is it um, a sort of testament, a celebration of those animals? Because those animals bring life to them. They bring food. They bring tools. Again, we don't know. The thing that's really interesting to note with Ice Age cave art, though, is 95% of the time, the animals that are depicted are prey. They're the ones that are hunted. So it's very rare to get the hunters depicted. So very, very rare you would get something like a lion or a bear depicted, or humans. Humans are very rarely depicted in Ice Age art. And when they are, they're really badly drawn. Really badly drawn. And yet, they're being engraved or painted by people who can create fantastic scenes and get imagery and, and sort of colours and profiles of animals in such a way. Sometimes, a mile underground in a dark cave but they're still able to paint these fantastic pictures, and yet we get stick men. It's very, very strange. But some cultures believe that you shouldn't represent human form. So maybe there is more to it than you know, perhaps meets the eye straight away. The thing, I mean, we'll discuss this a bit more in a moment. What I, I wanted to sort of throw into the mix then is all the art is created at the front of the cave. The reason being is that um, church hall faces the sun, so you get the natural lighting coming in. It's been engraved with natural lighting, so you need either the, the natural lighting of the sun to pick it out, or you need to shine your torch from a certain angle to pick it out. If you go into that cave and shine torchlight or artificial light directly onto the art, so straight in front, it will disappear completely. And I've tried this. So it's done at an angle with the light coming in, engraved you know, with the light from the side. But it's all done in the entranceway. So there's about 20, 25 pieces of art some are animals, some are symbols, so there are some V-shapes, there are some notches, um, but it's all done at the front, and it's all viewable from the viewing platform, except for one piece, which is done further down the back of the cave. And it's worth appreciating, or going back to how that cave was laid out when this art was created. So I, I said the, the floor level was at the top of the viewing platform. By the time you get to the end of the viewing platform, the ceiling would have been so low... 13,000 years ago, you'd have to kneel down. To get down to where the next piece of art is engraved, you've had to crawl down towards the back of the cave. The ceiling's getting lower the further you go. Um, and it's complete darkness at this point. Now, archaeologically, when this cave was excavated, there was evidence of fire directly below where this art was created. Um, and it was the right period, right time period. On the left, that's what it looks like. So you can see some engraved lines. It's not immediately apparent what it is. Even when I tell you what it is, it's not immediately apparent. But this is the one that causes the most controversy, I suppose. It's the one that's most debated. Even between the two Ice Age art experts who found this, completely different ideas on what they are. What um, one of the archaeologists said then is that they are birds long neck birds, which I can kind of see. I'll have to pull this off this time. Uh, you can almost see necks going into heads with maybe a beak, maybe up there. The others, not so much. So you've kind of got one there, one in here, a couple in there. So there's about five or six of these strange engravings. 
they look more like sock puppets to me though than birds and it's that thing again if 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 these people can carve out you know the ibis and the bison and the deer stag why are these ones a bit more subjective shall we say more importantly i think the thing that people miss is why is it done where it is if they're just birds why carve them right at the back where it's difficult to get down to and a place where no one's ever going to see it in the dark and a bit that you're almost having to lay down you're never going to know it's there so why do it now what the other archaeologists argued and this is the the stance i took in my research because i think he's right is he said that when you're that far down you're already having to sort of crouch or squat or kneel down to do it to get enough leverage to use a flint tool to carve on this wall if you can touch both walls at this point to get enough leverage to carve deeply enough on this wall you need because of the angle your body's at you need to press on the other wall and push against it so to do that you're almost hanging them upside down so he thinks the art's actually the wrong way round the person that did it did it was almost looking at it from an upside down perspective so then if we flip it it puts the art that way um, and it is important for what he thinks it is what i think it is and to base it on uh, continental comparisons of the same date so it, it flips it around then and it gives you shapes now where you see it curving that way so can you see it's not brilliantly easy to see but this is the best one to see so it starts there look it curves up up to about there curves around sweeps around in a curving motion just there and then back up is important because what he and i argue they are are stylistic representations of females female forms you're probably thinking what this is where the rave bit comes in, i think uh, seriously <laughs> stick with me um commonly that so this is done about 13,000 years ago commonly that stylized female form are known as venus figurines within ice age art but they're much much earlier you'd be looking um several thousand years earlier for the for the peak and they're normally uh, little models statuettes about that big but you always get the female form depicted in the same way so it's, it's very rare to have hands feet sometimes even legs or arms but what you will get is really really accentuated the head um the buttocks the swollen belly and the swollen breasts and the idea has been that they were fertility symbols or they represent female form in pregnancy you're probably thinking what's that got to do with this on the wall well if we compare it to examples from the continent then so that's the crest one this is the main one that I said to, to look at here look curving round these are examples from France two separate ones so they are carved on stone carved plaquettes and if you look amongst here can you see this figure i've redrawn it to the side just to show you and then there's this one here as well look at the shape look at the profile they do exactly what the crest wall one's doing so they're starting at the ankles the feet are not depicted start at the ankles around the knee and up around the back of the legs around the um the buttocks up the back head's not depicted but neither is it on this one neither is it on that one so can you see the similarities that then was the very first venus figurine ever found it's known as a venus in Pradique, and it's got no head it's got no feet it's got no arms interestingly it's got no breasts and it's got a flat stomach but it's still got the accentuated buttocks and do you see how it matches that theme so it's still a contentious issue because not everyone will entertain this this idea not everyone wants to um agree on it even when they will entertain it but it makes more sense to me is why go into the back of a dark cave to depict an animal when everything else is done at the front it's much more likely to go to the back of the cave into a dark cave to depict a female form now what we need to sort of um think about or discuss is but what does that female form mean so if it if it is a fertility symbol it's through a pregnancy it could just be something that you would hand to someone who you know wanted a child it could be a celebration of a, of a goddess you know the, the mother earth which again is a is a an interesting topic but they're much earlier these ones are different it's almost as if people i don't know 8000 years later were taking a similar concept but interpreting it in their own manner so they see it as something else but i always find it interesting that this it, it revolves around a cave caves caves are a way of getting into the mother earth one of the best ways of getting into the mother earth 
and it can't be a coincidence that when we first start to see um, humans burying their dead, they're buried in caves. So the earliest human burials we've got are in caves. And it's almost that idea about the life cycle for me, in that the cave represents the womb. So being in the cave is like being in the stomach, and leaving the cave through the cave, the, the tunnel and then the entranceway is like the birth canal. So, you know, you're born from the Mother Earth, and then you go back into the Mother Earth. Perhaps they're thinking that by burying them in caves, by doing this art in caves, they're celebrating that, maybe giving people chance of an afterlife, you know, in this world or the next. It seems maybe a bit far-fetched, but for thousands of years, this went on in this region. So, we haven't got any Ice Age burials from this period, but we have got human remains buried in the caves. One of the things that's never discussed at Cresswell is there were human remains in several of their caves, which was something I looked at for my research, including the skull of a young child. It was about one or two years old, so a skull burial placed in one of the caves, Mother Grundy's parlour. Um, but within the Cresswell region, there is uh, what's known as the Cresswell Heritage Area, and there are about another ten caves littered within two or three miles of Cresswell Crags. Several of those had burials in. Some had just skull burials. Some had skulls buried in stone boxes. Some had several individuals put into the cave and walled up. They were putting their dead back into the caves, back into the Mother Earth. It was only when they carbon dated it within the last few years that they found this process went on from prehistory all the way through into the Roman period. So several thousand years span. How did they know? How did people in the Roman period know that people 3,000 years ago were burying their dead in the caves? And how did they know that art was being done? How did they know in the Roman period, for example, that people were burying their dead in caves 25,000 years before that in Britain? So it's a strange concept, but clearly something's going on. And if you go back to the Venus figurines, they're found across Europe. Same size, same sort of detail, same similar carving, thousands of miles apart, hundreds of miles apart. So we've got some from Ukraine and Russia, We've got some from, you know, the sort of France, Germany, Holland, Belgium region. So clearly there is um, a belief system occurring across Europe, but it's how do we interpret it. The interesting point is it revolves around caves. Interesting for me anyway. That wasn't the only bit of art then. I just want to finish by... Yeah, sorry, yeah. Two minutes. I just want to quickly just finish then by just showing you one or two other little bits because that art is not the only art from Cresswell Crags. Two pieces of art had already been found at the site but they were mobile pieces of art carved onto animal bones. So this is Pinhole Man, a very rare example of a, of a human. It's on a rhinoceros bone. Interestingly, the rhinoceros bone is about 20,000 years older than the art that's carved onto it. Pinhole Man's right at the bottom, look. So this piece is about that big. Very thin, about that big. He's carved right at the bottom. I've zoomed in, so you can just about make him out, I hope. Here's his head and his body. Um, we know he's a man, and that's all I'm going to say. He's, uh, he was found in the 1920s by an antiquarian archaeologist, and he was described as being a masked anthropomorphic figure dancing a ceremonial dance. Hmm. That's just what I thought. Um... The one thing he's got right then, apart from it being a man, is, for me, he is masked. That's what I'll definitely say, because he's got a very strange head. What it looks like to me is he's wearing either a wolf or a bear pelt. So he's got a headdress on. And you can actually see, just above his waist, there's a line going across his waist. You can see just there, look. Which would be the bottom of the, the headdress. And we know people are doing this in this period. I don't know about dancing a ceremonial dance, but this was found in the pinhole cave, so it was found in the cave, and it was found with a bull roarer. Now, a bull roarer is a small piece of bone with a hole drilled through, attach it onto a leather thong. These are still used today in some cultures. You whirl it around your head, and it makes a resonating sound. Done in a cave, it can induce trance-like states, and people have tried it and done this. So, um, maybe this is a representation of a, a shaman figure. Difficult to say, but it's a strange one. But look how poor quality it is. And just the final image I want to show you then, this is the Cresswell horse, also engraved on bone. This is a horse rib bone. It's about that long, about that deep. But you'll see a horse. Imagine Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Here's his eye. There's his mane at the top. Comes down his head. 
There's his nostril, so around his nose and mouth, and down towards his front legs. So his body's going that way. Can you just about make that out? Um, it's much better if you look at it on a smaller image. Um, but when I was doing my book then, this piece had gone off to the British Museum for, the, for their conservator to do some analysis of it. And what they found is it had been engraved with a flint, but it was three stages to it. So someone had drawn this horse in one swoop. So they'd taken the flint object and they carved it. They hadn't stopped. They'd done it in one swoop. So right from the back all the way down till they get to this jaw line, all one trace. So this was a very skilled artist to be able to do this. They'd drawn the, the horse then, and then over the top they'd put a series of vertical lines, and you can see them look running all the way down. And you can see that they sit over the horse. And what they think this was is, and again, people hunt reindeer in this manner, is by fixing a series of posts into the ground, when you chase the horse or the deer or whatever at speed, um, as it's running so fast, because of its vision to the side, it sees the post as one long fence almost. It doesn't know there are gaps in. So it just keeps running. It thinks it can't escape, so it keeps running. So they're, they're leading it to an ambush or off the top of the cliff or whatever. Over the top of that, someone had then taken a flint tool and gouged it out. So you can see that on that left-hand side. They gouged out the horse. They took red ochre, natural pigment, rubbed that into it, and then snapped it. And it seemed, from what they could see in the microscope, to all have been done at the same time. And what they think it is, is uh, a kill. So they're going to hunt horse. We know at this period they're hunting horse. They engrave it, and then they destroy it. They kill it to help in the hunt. And again, it's what some sort of scholars would call hunting magic. Could just be a depiction of a horse. But it doesn't explain what the other things, you know, are, are doing. I'll leave it at that then. If you want to read a little bit more, that's my book then. So it is a, a study, I suppose, more of the archaeology on the site. But there's an entire chapter dedicated to the art, how we know, um, how we know it's there, how we know how old it is how it was found, and a description of, of that art. So if you are interested, have a look for that. Thank you very much.